Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Monsters Manifested, right here on DM Tools with Max McCool. On today's episode, we're going to be continuing our journey through the demon types with the Quasit. So, without further ado, let's get right into it. The Quasit's stat block can be found on page 63 of the Monster Manual, and its lore can be found on page 54. So let's begin there, shall we? Quasits infest the lower plains. Physically weak, they keep to the shadows to plot mischief and wickedness. More powerful demons use Quasits as spies and messengers when they aren't devouring them or pulling them apart to pass the time. A Quasit can assume animal forms, but in its true form it looks like a two-foot-tall green humanoid with a barbed tail and horns. The Quasit has clawed fingers and toes, and these claws can deliver an irritating poison. It prefers to be invisible when it attacks. And that's all there is when it comes to the lore of the Quasit. Once again, it's pretty short and concise, which seems to be a going trend with the demonic lore that we've covered in previous episodes. So, it's to be expected. But there is some interesting bits there of information that I believe we can use when developing an adventure. Stuff like its preference to be invisible, the fact that it can deliver a poison, the fact that it's almost kind of like a peon between the higher ranking demons or the greater demons, if you would, seems to be on the low end of the lesser demons. So we could even use that to play into our scenarios or adventures when we develop them. But before we jump into all of that, let's move on to the stats. So before we jump into the stat block proper of the Quasit, there's a little bit of a ribbon text here for a variant Quasit in the form of a familiar. So before we get into the nitty gritty of the stat block for the Quasit, I'm just going to read out this Quasit familiar variant text for you guys to hear, and maybe that'll help us come up with some more ideas. Mortal spellcasters interested in extra planar familiars find Quasits easy to summon and eager to serve. The Quasit plays the part of the obsequious servant. It serves its master well, but it goads the mortal to greater and greater acts of chaos and evil. Such Quasits have the following trait. Familiar. The Quasit can serve another creature as a familiar, forming a telepathic bond with its willing master. While the two are bonded, the master can sense what the Quasit senses as long as they are within one mile of each other. While the Quasit is within ten feet of its master, the master shares the Quasit's magic resistance trait. At any time and for any reason, the Quasit can end its service as a familiar, ending the telepathic bond. Huh. So that is interesting, because that invokes a notion of developing a character, be it a villain or an NPC of some sort, that has a Quasit familiar, and perhaps the Quasit is influencing them to do certain things or partake in certain actions that are not necessarily the best. And you can generate this sort of ongoing instance where perhaps your players interact with this character in multiple instances. And after every time they go back to interact with said NPC, they become more and more corrupted and chaotic and stuff. So I think that there's something we could do there using the familiar variant with the closet as well. But before we jump in too deep, too quick, let's move on to the stat block. The Quasit is a tiny fiend, demon, shape changer, with a chaotic evil alignment. It has an armor class of 13, hit points that average 7, or 3d4, and it has a movement speed of 40 feet. The Quasit has a strength of 5, a dexterity of 17, a constitution of 10, an intelligence of 7, a wisdom of 10, and a charisma of 10. Its skills include stealth plus 5. It is resistant to the damage types of cold, fire, lightning, bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non-magical weapons. It is immune to the damage type of poison, and it is immune to the poison condition. The Quasit has the senses of dark vision for 120 feet and a passive perception of 10. It can speak the languages of Abyssal and Common, and is a challenge rating of 1. On to the abilities. Shape Changer. The Quasit can use its action to polymorph into a beast form that resembles a bat, with a movement speed of 10 feet and a fly speed of 40 feet, a centipede with a movement speed of 40 feet and a climb speed of 40 feet, or a toad with a movement speed of 40 feet and a swim speed of 40 feet, or 
back into its true form. Its statistics are the same in each form, except for the speed changes noted. Any equipment it is wearing or carrying is not transformed. It reverts to its true form if it dies. Magic Resistance The Quasit has advantage on saving throws against spells and other magical effects. On to the actions. Claws Bite in beast form Is a melee weapon attack with a plus 4 to hit, a reach of 5 feet on one target. On a hit, it does an average of 5 or 1d4 plus 3 piercing damage, and the target must succeed on a DC 10 constitution saving throw or take an average of 5 or 2d4 poison damage and become poisoned for one minute. The target can repeat the saving throw at the end of each of its turns, ending the effect on itself on a success. Scare Can be done once per day. One creature of the Quasit's choice within 20 feet of it must succeed on a DC 10 wisdom saving throw or be frightened for one minute. The target can repeat the saving throw at the end of each of its turns, with disadvantage if the Quasit is within line of sight, ending the effect on itself on a success. And finally, Invisibility. The Quasit magically turns invisible until it attacks or uses Scare, or until its concentration ends, as if concentrating on a spell. Any equipment the Quasit wears or carries is invisible with it. And that's all there is when it comes to the stats of the Quasit. So, pretty straightforward when it comes to the stats as well of the Quasit, sort of to be expected from the lore that we read. There's an interesting choice of creatures that it can change into, the bat, the centipede, or the toad. However, it makes sense because it creates sort of a utility-based monster, if you would. So you can use that to apply the Quasit actually in multiple scenarios or multiple environments, really, where it can be used as a bat, it can be used as a centipede, or it can be used as a toad, given the circumstances where geographically and what kind of environment your players are currently in if you wanted to place a Quasit. So also the scare action I find is pretty interesting. So effectively it invokes frightened on characters or on your players if they fail the saving throw. But I think that that can be utilized in more of a narrative way and in a way to invoke and drive your players forward in terms of what they face on their adventure. But before we go any further with what we could do, let's jump into some adventure crafting, shall we? Okay, so the first thing that comes to mind for me immediately when looking at the closet and how to implement it in an adventure or a scenario for the players at the table is basically what I had mentioned previously when I had read the variant text, the closet familiar text, if you would, where you would essentially have a closet that has made a deal with an NPC of some sort. Now, what the nature of that deal is and what the NPC is doing in terms of holding up their end of that deal is up to you. And you can go in many different directions when it comes to that, right? You could have something perhaps where you have an artifact dealer or a merchant of some sort who trades in perhaps treasures or occult items or some sort of oddity or curio type of shop in a town or perhaps even as a traveling merchant. You could have the individual be someone who can't quite stay in one spot for too long because the chaos invoked by the closet seems to garner the attention of the city guard or the individuals of the settlement, whatever they may be, you know, be it cell swords or a royal guard or some sort of guild that protects and serves, you know, a policing force of some sort. And so what ends up happening is you can develop this sort of tale or rumor that goes along throughout the different places that your players encounter or your players go to. And they always have tales of this accursed merchant who comes in with a wagon, stays for no longer than a week or two, and then quickly must leave off to go to the next town on their trade route. But wherever they stop off, chaos and destruction seems to ensue. And you could create something that's very cool where your players are kind of constantly tailing this merchant trying to get to them 
and see what the real story is and what's going on with them. You could even have an instance where perhaps the merchant's deal with the closet is that the merchant will sell off these relics or artifacts or treasures, what have you, any kind of item like that to the people of the town. And then what the closet does is it goes invisible and breaks into people's houses or into their vaults or their safes or anything like that. And it ends up stealing back all of the items that the merchant has sold to the customers or to the people of the settlement, collects everything, throws it in the wagon, and then manages to take off before they get noticed or before they get found out by the local authorities or by the people or anything like that. And so what your players have to do is figure out how to get to this merchant and confront them about it and see what's going on and try to stop them from running this sort of criminal scam, if you would, of selling items and then having the closet pick them up and come back. You could even have something where the merchant is a legitimate merchant, but during their travels along the trade route, they have to allow the closet, because that's their end of the deal, is they have to allow the closet to go in and cause chaos of some sort, right? Now, what is that? Maybe the closet pickpockets people and takes their coin or their valuables, something like that. Perhaps the closet goes in and consumes as much livestock as it can. Perhaps the closet steals some sort of item of note specific to that town or that settlement, and that could even influence the trade route of the merchant. So the closet is dictating where they go in terms of forming their trade route, and all of the towns that they go to, there is some sort of ancient item or ancient relic that is of value to the closet for whatever reason. So you could even have the closet familiar that has made a deal with the merchant, but the closet also has a deal made with a greater demon or a higher ranking demon. And so that's kind of the chain of command and the chain of behavior for the closet. It's what influences its behavior and why it wants to go to those areas. Perhaps there's old relics of worship or effigies of these greater demons. Perhaps there's spots there where the magical weave is thinner and they can implant some sort of item or device that allows for traversal between the abyss and the material plane. And you could have something like that where effectively your players are kind of like medieval high fantasy exterminators because wherever they go, there's basically infestations of lesser demons, you know, and you can scale up as your players level up what the demons are and what kinds of demons are released. And I think that that could lead to a very straightforward adventure or a straightforward set of adventures if you wanted to have this sort of evil villainous individual who may not necessarily be evil themselves. They're just kind of in a bad predicament, let's say, if you wanted to go that route. And the players have to stop the corruption of these towns or these settlements or the infestation of these towns and settlements and cities of a demonic presence, right? However, another avenue that I think you could go and would be pretty interesting to go, still using the merchant with the closet deal, would be a merchant that is not necessarily a traveling merchant. You could have something like that, and they'd sort of cross paths with the players every once in a while. But if you had a merchant that was a decent merchant that was not necessarily committing any heinous acts or anything like that, but the merchant had a closet familiar that it made a deal with where the closet would go around finding these relics and these items, both even in the abyss or in the material plane or both, and bringing them to the merchant so that the merchant could always have a steady stream of high quality rarities that could be sold for a pretty penny. And what happens is, is that all of those items are cursed or evil or nefarious in one way or the other, and they generate this sort of corruption amongst their possessors, right? So anybody that buys one of these items from the merchant will eventually become corrupted. And what you can do is, is you can present this merchant, especially if it's a merchant that your players will run into multiple times, or you'd like them to run into multiple times, you can have this merchant sort of begin to deteriorate in both mind and body every successive time the players interact with them, right? You can say that perhaps they appear to be a little thinner than they were the first time you guys met them. 
Their personality seems to be pretty normal, like it was the last time you interacted with them and bought something from them, or the last time that they had a job for you and they offered you a thing, but they seem to lose sight or lose focus a bit more now. They seem to sort of zone out and look off into space and quickly have to be kicked back into reality, if you would, or snapped back into reality. And as you go on through your adventures or through your campaign and your players see more and more of them, they witness their decay more and more and more. And you could even have that merchant end up being a big boss for them to fight or perhaps something to the effect of where it becomes so corrupted, it becomes this sort of horrific individual. You know, you can pull from all of those kinds of old folkloric tales where an individual has a curse bestowed upon them and it begins to mutate them and they become something entirely different, right? They could become a hag. They could become a troll. They could become any sort of thing that you would like them to become. You know, you could even have them turn into some sort of half demonic monster, you know, have them turn into perhaps a demon themselves, you know, perhaps over time they're shrinking or changing form and they become a quasit themselves. Perhaps all of these interactions and this corruption has caused the merchant to transform into a quasit themselves. And now the quasit that was their familiar has now ranked up in the league of the demons. And perhaps it has become something greater than what it once was. Perhaps now the quasit is now something to the tune of a Nalfeshni, like we discussed last episode, or perhaps something like a Kazme, you know, something perhaps a bit more intelligent, you know, depending on who knows how long maybe this corruption has gone on for, how long you'd like to play out this sort of decay and desecration of the individual. Perhaps the more and more they do it, the stronger and stronger the quasit becomes. And all of a sudden they went from a quasit to becoming now worthy of being a Gristro or something like that, some massive monster. And then that's what the players have to contend with at the apex of their adventures, right? That final grand battle, let's say. Another way that you could implement the quasit that I think would be a bit more straightforward but sort of a quick pick up and play type scenario. You know, if you don't want to create this whole involved type of long tail scenario or situation, as previously discussed with the merchant and the familiar and stuff, is you could use the quasit as something like a pest, right? Like, as I had mentioned earlier, like it's an extermination job, right? And what's happening is, is perhaps a town or a city is being infested with these creatures that the quasit can shape change into. Imagine a city or a town believing that they're plagued. So they are experiencing and suffering through these different sort of torturous situations where, you know, you have a rain of frogs or toads in this case. Perhaps after that, you have an infestation of bats at night. Shortly after that, you have centipedes crawling out of the earth and through people's cellars and stuff like that and causing chaos and damage and hurting the people of the town and killing their pets or something, eating their cats and dogs or their chickens, what have you. And nobody really knows what to do. You know, perhaps the holy person in the town has said that this is a corruption. This is a, a penance that they have to pay for all of their sins or something like that. And now they're sort of invoking these plagues that are thought to take place when a place has become cursed or corrupted or has lost their holiness, if you would. But in reality, what it is, is just these quasits have managed to make their way through the weave or through the dimensions into the material plane and have decided that this small town or settlement or village is easy pickings for them. And so they can just go in and cause as much havoc and chaos as they would like to, and, you know, fill their bellies with food, fill their non-existent pockets with gold and shiny things, and they can bring everything back to the abyss to serve the higher demon that they are beholden to, right? That they have a deal with or that ranks above them, you know, and you can keep something like that quite straightforward that allows for a deceiving adventure, if you would, or a deceiving mystery, I guess, to be solved, where the player's have to figure out what's going on and is this town really cursed? Are these really sort of acts of God, if you would? Are these really the plagues taking place or is there something else going on? Is there something more behind the scenes? And you can have them figure that out and perhaps realize that something isn't right. 
You could have maybe one of them roll perception checks or maybe use their passive perception because they wouldn't necessarily be looking for it. But if a quasit, let's say, tries to pickpocket them while it's invisible and it fails the roll or it rolls lower than one of your player's passive perceptions, you can tell them, hey, you notice a tugging on your pouch, on your belt, and you look and you don't see anything. What do you do? Right. And if they grab it, they can feel something there, tries to pull away or whatever, and it loses its concentration. And then bang, they see a quasit there. Combat ensues, and then they can realize what's going on. Or perhaps they see the quasit shape change into one of those creatures, right? The bat, the toad, the centipede, or what have you. And they go, aha, that's what it is. That's what's causing this, right? Or they can say, aha, this quasit turned into a bat and flew away. So we know what the bat infestation was. The bat infestation certainly wasn't a plague. It seems to have been quasits causing some sort of havoc. But now that that's out of the way and sorted out, what's going on with the centipedes and the toads? How's that working? You see? And you can create, I think, a pretty cool investigative adventure there using the quasit three different ways, right? One monster, three different ways, three different instances, and it's the same thing behind all of it. All in all, though, I think that the Quasit is a pretty interesting monster. It's pretty cool. It's a little weak, obviously. It's only a CR1, so you can use it in low-level play if you'd like, if you wanted to replace something to the tune of, like, orcs or something like that. But I kind of feel like the Quasit is not necessarily served best as a group monster or a horde monster, even though you can implement them like that. Like I said, if you want to go the route of like infestation or something like that. But I think that having a quasit as a singular creature that is sort of pulling strings or operating under the cloak of invisibility and darkness, if you would, can invoke a lot of interesting ideas and concepts that can come from it. And you can use its ability to scare people as a means of it getting what it wants from common folk. You can use its ability to go invisible, to have it behave like, I said, like an urchin of some sort, you know, like a pickpocket, a petty thief, something like that. You can use it in the way I mentioned previously with the merchant, where it kind of steals back the goods that the merchant had sold to their customers. The corrupting ability of the closet upon the people that it creates a contract with or the ones that summon it, I think can lead to good long tail stuff, like good long tail adventures and scenarios for your players to deal with and contend with, especially when it becomes a character that they've established a rapport with or some kind of a relationship with. And I think that a closet for its size and for its challenge rating and for its potential threat or lack thereof can cause a lot of havoc, even though it's something that appears to be relatively diminutive and harmless. But that's all I got for you fine folks today when it comes to the closet and ways that you could implement it for a scenario or adventure for the players at your table. On next week's episode, we're going to be covering the shadow demon. So that should be cool. See how we can implement that in different instances. But until then, I'd like to thank you all very much for tuning in. I highly appreciate it. Please feel free to leave a rating, review wherever you can. Let me know what you like, what you don't like. Give me five stars, give me one star, whatever feels right to you. Please feel free to follow and share this podcast to whomever you'd like to, whoever you think would get a kick out of it one way or the other. If you're listening to this episode of Monsters Manifested on YouTube, I'd kindly ask that you like, comment, share, subscribe, all those fun things. Hit that notification bell thingy. I heard it does something as it would help me out, help the podcast out, help the channel out, help it grow, help it get to more ears for more people that are interested in running D&D or some sort of fantasy tabletop, perhaps in getting started as a dungeon master or game master themselves, or perhaps someone that just needs some food for thought or a little bit of inspiration to jumpstart their creativity muscles and kind of get the ball rolling when it comes to ideas for their campaigns or adventures at their table. But until the next one, thank you all once again very much for tuning in, and I'll catch you on the next one. Have a good day, everyone.